are. Exodus 3, I'm going to start at verse 1. I'm going to go like verse 1 to 10 if you want to read with me. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had come over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. A lot of sites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Pray with me. God, we just thank you tonight that uh, we know you're in this place. We know that your presence is already here as we've worshiped you. We know as we're here, God, in your presence, all things are possible. So we just ask that the overflow from that worship that already started, the laughter that's already been here, the, the excitement, we ask that, God, what we've already stirred up in this place, we know that your spirit is hovering over these waters. And so as we stir up the waters, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd also stir up. We pray that every word spoken, that it wouldn't be mine, it wouldn't be my thoughts, it would be your thoughts, your ways, and God, it'd be your mouth that speaks tonight. So, Lord, if there's a single part of me that's not in alignment with you, I ask that just you'd push me out of the way and you'd speak to this house. Because we're a people that are in need of your voice. Not the voice of men, not the voice of presidents, not the voices of athletes, but the voice of God and God alone. So I thank you that that voice, that sound, it's here, it's active, and it's willing to penetrate every heart here tonight. We ask that you do it in Jesus' awesome name. Everybody says tonight, amen. Let's give God a shout to get ready. Amen. And then you can grab your seat. Let's do it. So uh, a young boy had just gotten his driving permit, and uh, he went to his father. He asked him, and this father was a minister. And he asked him, uh, I'd like to discuss with you the use of the family car his father took him to his study, and he said to him, uh, okay, I'll make a deal with you. You bring up your grades, study your Bible a little more, uh, get your hair cut, and we'll talk about it. Uh, so after about a month, the boy came back. Uh, he asked his dad again, he's like, okay, can we discuss the use of the car? So they again went to the father's study, and he said, son, you know, I'm, I'm honestly really proud of you. I think you're doing an amazing job. You've gotten all your grades up. Yeah, you study your Bible diligently, but you didn't cut your hair. So the young man waited a moment, replied, you know, Dad, I, as you said, I've been reading the Bible a lot lately. Samson had long hair. Noah had long hair. Moses had long hair. You know what? Even Jesus had long hair. The father replied, yeah, you're, you're so right, son. And they walked everywhere they went. Now, I remember when I was 16 and I was trying to get used to the car, my dad finally made a deal that uh, you, had to, you had to drive his vehicle, but it was his vehicle. You had to put your own gas in it. He'd cover the insurance because you had to save money for college. So I was looking back on 
uh, even when I had long hair, I thought about setting this up like it was my story, but um, my dad didn't make me cut my hair. I actually cut my hair right before I became youth pastor, and I was thinking of my long hair days. And I was thinking about these different people in the Bible like Samson and Noah and Moses and Jesus. And um, I mean, there's a few people like Samson that they did have long hair. We don't have actual records of everybody, whether they had long hair. A few people, you know, like they actually were bald, the Bible says, or they took a Nazarite bow, which means they couldn't cut their hair. But Moses, this man the Bible referenced here, um, I've heard a lot of stories about Moses growing up. Any of y'all heard about Moses growing up? Get your hand up. Okay, so quite a few of you. Um, if you haven't, don't worry, I'm going to enlighten you a little bit. Um, I've heard a lot of stories about Moses. This is the dude that when he went into Egypt, there was all these plagues. He parted the sea. Uh, he took the people through the wilderness. I mean, there's a lot to tell about Moses. There's this specific account, this instance, though, where Moses, as we just read, came to this burning bush. He came here, and there was a sense of conversation that took place in the midst of this bush on fire. Now, I guess before I, I want to get in too much on too many different things, I want to come out of the gate and speak one thing, because I've had this thought in my mind. I feel like some people, they take the Bible at face value to one degree, but they don't allow it to really transform their life to another degree. So they're like, okay, a bush is on fire, uh, yeah. Either that's not possible, or that's never going to happen for me. So immediately when we talk about hearing the sounds, hearing the voice of God, I feel like some people immediately want to count themselves out because they've never seen a bush that is constantly on fire and never going out. Or, man, I'm never going to see that. And so immediately you just want to count yourself out and think, well, then I guess I can't hear from God. And I, I honestly felt this. For every person in this room, there are moments in our lives where God lights a bush on fire to get our attention. Now, maybe it's not an actual bush. But he lights it up. He wants to get our attention and here's the problem. We're too caught up in whatever we're doing to even notice it. Like literally, it could just be there on fire and we're just carrying on in life, talking to our friends and searching the internet, driving around. We get too caught to even notice that right here, God's trying to get our attention. Could be in this message tonight. I believe it will be. It could have been in worship already. It could be you're just going to be driving home tonight. It could be... Two weeks from now, I don't know. But I think there's moments when God is trying to get our attention and we're too caught up in whatever we got going on that God's already lit stuff on fire in front of you to make sure that you could hear him, you could see him, you could know him, and you're not willing to participate. Now, if you don't know this story of Moses a whole lot, let me set it up. Moses is a Hebrew. Uh, we would know them like the Jewish people, the Israelites. And he was raised in an Egyptian's home, not just any Egyptian's home. He was raised in Pharaoh's home, the king of Egypt. Now, at that time, Pharaoh kind of put this, like, thing out to all the people saying, hey, if you have a baby boy born, kill him. Moses, at that time, was one of those baby boys, those Hebrew baby boys. So, obviously, his mom couldn't kill him, and they were searching. The Egyptians are going out searching for the Hebrew babies, trying to kill the baby boys. So Moses' mom put him in a basket, put him down the river. And <laughs> it's crazy how God writes history and how he puts his story together to bring it to us today. The mom trying to rescue her baby Moses from the Egyptians, where does she end up? In the hands of an Egyptian, Pharaoh's daughter. Now, an of all people's houses, the place that Moses ends up is the very household of the guy trying to kill him. It's sort of uh, ironic just how God puts the story together. So Pharaoh's daughter brings in Moses, brings him to be his own, raises him up. Roughly for 40 years, Moses was known as the prince of Egypt. He was in this household. He's raised in it. And at some point, I imagine as he's growing up, he starts to realize, I don't look like everyone else. There's something a little bit different about me. 
like everybody else, maybe has a little bit different skin complexion than I, than I do. I, I stand out a little bit. Finally, at some point, he realizes, I'm not an Egyptian. And God had a plan as all of these Hebrew babies were being killed. God had a plan in the midst of all that to rescue this one Hebrew. God is so intentional with his plan Every person in this room, the plan he has for you, because it's not just about you. He wants to use you to rescue a lot of other people. He's raised up, finally realizes, dang, I'm, I'm a Hebrew. We, we know it because the Bible shows us in Exodus chapter 2, right before we got to chapter 3. 2 is before 3. Verse 11, one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people now, the, the slaves, his own people, he's starting to put this all together and watch them at their hard work. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Like, he gets it. He's like, man, these are my people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand, just like a boss. You touch my people. The next day, he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid. He's tripping right now. And he thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, now Pharaoh's ticked again. He tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh, went to live in Midian. So here we go. Hebrew, raised in the Egyptian home, prince of Egypt, now realizes Man, these are my people being hated on right here. They're being whipped. They're being abused. You don't be touching my people. So then he kills the dude. He flees to Midian. Now we find him here in Midian. He's once a prince of Egypt. Now what is he? What does the Bible say? Chapter 3, what we just read. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Moses goes from being a prince of Egypt to a shepherd. Shepherd is a lowly position, y'all. He went from people designing him his own clothing so he could have the latest fashion in Egypt, people making his own food, people serving him hand and foot, people constantly cleaning up after him. Now he's leading a bunch of smelly, disgusting sheep all over the place. I don't know, cleaning up their poop, maybe not, letting them walk in it, he's walking in it, I don't know. But he's going from being like clean, put together and served to dirty, trying to lead sheep and having to serve them. You see the flip. The Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. He don't care whether you're a king. He don't care whether you're a president. He don't care whether you're a slave. He don't care whether you're uh, a beggar on the street. He don't care. He no respecter of persons. If God has a plan for your life, no matter what position you're in, God is going to maneuver you to make sure you can fulfill the plan that he has for you. So here he is with these sheep, just like Jesus is called the shepherd. I find this so interesting. Picture this with me. He's here, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of sheep. I don't know how many there were. Imagine him staff in hand, leading these sheep. And let's flash forward here. See, God has a plan for where he places you and a purpose for where he places you. He doesn't do it on an accident. Maybe some of you hate the house that you're growing up. Some of you hate the city you live in. You hate the school you're in. Maybe some of you, like, you really just don't like it. It's not what you would dream up. I have some, some students that they'll come to church alone all the time because their parents are divorced or, or alcoholics or fighting all the time, and they come here all alone. And they would probably say, this really isn't the plan I would have dreamed up for me. This really isn't the place I would want to be. But God doesn't place you there on accident. He puts you there on purpose. He puts you there because even though it's painful, even though it's odd, even though it doesn't make sense, he knows if you're not in that place at that time, then he cannot fulfill the plan for humanity that he has that you're designed to help Destin and take place in. Moses, he's here, hundreds, I don't know, thousands, like I said, of sheep, holding his staff, flash forward, 
He's standing before millions of Israelites now with a staff in his hand, leading them through the wilderness, leading them through the desert for 40 years. Isn't it interesting how God taught him with a staff how to lead a group of sheep because years later, God was going to place him with a staff in front of millions of people leading them as well? Isn't it interesting that maybe God puts you in a place that you wouldn't design for yourself, but he designs it for something he he knows he has in store for you in the future? That maybe you wouldn't design to work in a specific place or you wouldn't design certain things, but he places you there with a staff in your hand with some sheep that seems lowly, that seems unimportant, and seems like it's not leading anywhere. I mean, I used to sit, I loved math, first of all. I loved math class, but I used to sit, I remember high school, and people would be like, why we got to learn math? We're never going to use this ever in our lives, ever. We're never going to use math. And like, first of all, they need to go to another English class because they can't even talk straight, first of all. And people are like, well, I'm never going to use this. I'm never going to use shepherding. Like, this ain't going to... And picture it, flash forward, hundreds of sheep, millions of people. God taught him how to lead with few so he'd be prepared to lead many. And I think sometimes we just get caught up in the few that we have in front of us and the little unimportant things that we have in front of us that we completely forget that God's setting us up for something bigger. This is what I really want to speak to you tonight. That was a side note. If God lights any more bushes on fire, for some of you, because you're like, man, get my attention, God. Come on, speak to me, God. If he lights any more bushes on fire, he's going to finish off the forest. You're so distracted. You're so not in tune. You're so unwilling to bend, surrender, and really listen to receive what he has for you. If he keeps trying to light more bushes on fire to get your attention, we're going to have an epidemic with the rainforest. We're going to have a problem. I think God wants to tell some of you tonight, I've already got your attention, and I'm one more time, I'm going to get your attention. I'm going to light something up one more time tonight to get your attention, and I want you to listen to what I have to say. I want you to dig in what, it, what, I, what I have to say. That's what God's saying. I feel like, and this is for me, man, I just, I've been struggling with this hard. I talked about rest a number of weeks ago, just how we stay busy all the time. And I feel like a lot of us, including me, we're so preoccupied with our own life that we can't hear God's voice. We don't know his plan. We don't know the purpose he has for us. We have no idea what what our destiny could look like. We have no idea what the call of God. You know, Sid last week talked about the cadence of God and the beat of God through his word, through prayer, through worship, through the call he has in your life. And some of us, honestly, we just... We can't hear it. He's just like right next to your ear dumb, just like. That was a pretty good cadence with my tongue half, don't you think? Like he's slamming and we're just like, oh, miss, did you guys hear that? Because we're so preoccupied with our own life. See, you thought you'd live things up in the palace like Moses. You thought that the best plan for your life must be to just Live it up and enjoy life. I'm going to do me. I'm going to enjoy this palace. I'm getting served, man. I'm getting like the best, best pizza made up for me, man. I'm getting sloppy joes. I don't know, whatever your food is, think in your mind for a second. Like, actually say it out loud. One, two, three. I heard fried what? Fried chicken? You can get that at KFC, bro. I'm talking about Pharaoh's palace cooking it for you. Really good fried chicken. <laughs> And I feel like some of us, we get caught so easily in a palace routine, a palace pace. I'm going to serve me. It's about me. As long as I feel fulfilled, then it's all good. As long as I feel good, as long as my emotions are straight, then it's all good. You know what? Screw the world. I I could care less how they feel. I could honestly care less even if the person next to me makes it. As long as I'm doing good, then we're good. And we get caught up in this palace routine, man. As long as we're feeling good and life is good, then things must actually be good. But see, with God, it's completely different. You actually have to run from the palace to find rest in the pasture if you actually want to hear his voice. You actually have to ditch the palace and find the pasture if you actually want to hear the sound. 
we become comfortable with a palace pace, a palace routine. I get what I want. Life is good for me. I got friends. This is what's going on. This is what's straight. And we get really caught up in just when things are good, when God's saying, no, actually what I destined for you to is to ditch all that, run from the palace, and rest in the pasture so you can actually hear me. I'm actually making you ditch all that. If you listen to me, I'm actually saying, ditch all that you think is just great and actually go hang out with a bunch of stinky sheep. Because if you'll do that, you'll actually hear from me. You'll actually be able to know what I sound like. You can't hear God through the pace of your past life. Your friends, your schedule, your sports, video games, for me, ministry. For real. I went right from collision to the next thing, to we travel with the band. This weekend we're doing the Embrace Conference. We literally go in the studio. We're tracking the album. We start the next week after that. It's really nonstop pace. And in the midst of that, I'm saying, God, where's the pasture? So like, I've been trying something. I like literally sat at my table, and I'm like, okay, God, I'm going to start small because I've let the pace of my life get out of hand. So I'm going to start small, 15 minutes. I'm literally going to sit and just complete surrender for 15 minutes. Now, I, I find all the time I'll read my word, or I, I'm praying throughout the day. I pray in the spirit. I, I, I'm, I'm praying. I, I, I'm connected to God, but am I fully in tune with the sounds? I think as much as you can be with a palace pace. Guys, it's hard to hear him through Times Square. It's really hard. So I'm just trying to start with something simple. Something simple to say, here I am, God. I'm desperate to hear you. So what you have to do is you have to separate yourself from the palace if you actually want to be there by a blazing fire. If you want to see it, you can almost like hear the, the flame crackle and pop. You're so in tune with the sound of God. Exodus 3.1, that verse continues, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. You have to find moments of chill in the pasture. You have to wait in the wilderness. Sometimes we look at the idea of the wilderness because wilderness kind of just sounds like that like a desert, dry, not much going on. Usually the wilderness is described a lot in Scripture as kind of a place that you don't want to find, find yourself, but hey, I'm inviting it. I'm, a, I'm saying I'm going to wait in the wilderness. I'm going to rest in the pasture. Maybe I got some stinky sheep. Maybe it ain't exactly what I would have dialed up at times, but I'm kind of inviting God saying, hey, Lord, this place, if this is where you're telling me you're going to show up, if this is where you're saying you're going to be active, then this is where I want to wait to hear you. This is where I'm going to hear the sound. Moses had to find himself in a place finally to receive the sound, receive the destiny that God had for him, but it wasn't like he thought it was going to be. We, we dream up and we dial up in our head all these things that we think that God is going to be and God is going to do, and if we pray or if we do all this, then God will do it. And God usually is like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to do the opposite. Why? Because he's a mean God, because he hates us, because, nah, because he, wants to, he wants to teach us. He wants to show us that, listen, Hollywood, social media, all these things that look like a hashtag blessed life, that ain't blessing, guys. That's something that's going to waste away and fall apart. He has to rewrite society. He has to rewrite culture. He has to show us that despite this is the world we live in, and I'm on social media, I watch movies from Hollywood, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, but I don't gear my life off of these things. I gear my life off of being in the pasture, hearing his voice. That's what I hunger for. That's what I crave. That's what I want to know. And Moses had to kind of see this whole thing rewritten to see how God wanted to speak to him. So he's out here with the sheep. He turns, and he sees this bush on fire. Now, this was sort of like not something that probably happened all the time. He sees this bush on fire. 
He sees the flames licking up over the top of it, but it's not burning up. This is nuts. Like, think about this. Now, when I light stuff on fire the other day, uh, <laughs> yeah, don't play with fire, kids. Uh, there was all these sticks and stuff that I had cut down and stuff that we were trying to like clear out of our yard and I couldn't get my lawnmower started. And um, I'm not super handy, so I called PP and we kept trying to work on it. And uh, after me and Pastor Paul couldn't get it working, I was kind of like, well, I got to like find something productive to do. So I did all my weed whacking, outlining where I would have mowed if I had a mower. And then I was like, well, I'll just burn all this stick, all these sticks and stuff. And guys, I wasn't an Eagle Scout like Pastor Tyler, okay? Um, Royal Rangers, like that was like the Christian version of like Boy Scouts. I only did that to like, basically when girls were hot, I was like, see ya. Uh, I was going to youth, man. <laughs> like, um, I was out of there. And uh, so I built, I built the knife and had this thing called a cut and chop card and you had to know how to properly use it and you had to pass it. They make you hold it by the blade and pass it that way. Oh, so I want to cut myself. I don't think so. And uh, so I didn't quite learn how to make fires and all that. So all that I could think to do is, I know you need this stuff called like kindling or whatever, like the smaller sticks. And so I put that stuff at the bottom and I started putting the big logs in there. And so I just took my five gallon gas can and I just poured it all over it. And if I was being uh, halfway intelligent, I would have lit a match and threw it. I thought what would be a better idea was it start the lighter and then light it. <laughs> Whoa! Like that thing, sky high, dude. <laughs> like, I was in the glory of God. Like... Okay, so if that isn't bad enough, it gets worse. After I had got the fire going for a while, I had more stuff to burn, but it was really windy. So as I kept adding stuff, it kind of kept going out a little bit. But there was enough of a flame going, if I could just get that flame going a little bit more. So I took the, the five gallon of gas. <laughs> and I tossed some on. And as I was sort of like pulling it back, I saw that flame follow that gas all the way out into the air, dude. <clears throat> I was trying to get ready for this sermon. I was trying to make sure I was good and ready for anything burning. But believe me, I heard God. Uh, I heard him say, you're an idiot. <laughs> and uh, Moses is taking all this in. Now, he wasn't starting any fire. This was a fire generated on its own. He's just lingering. A bush is on fire, and it's not burning up. Now, eventually, that fire that I made continually just kept going out, and I had to keep. This thing is just on um, par, man. And so it says in, in verse 3, this is Moses' response. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight why the fire does not burn up. The, the Bible, to me, is just really funny at times. If you'll take a second and just take it all in, a bush is on fire. It's not burning. The phrase that the Bible uses is, I'm going to go over and see this strange sight. A strange sight is when you walk out into the kitchen, your little brother is in his Batman underwear eating Lucky Charms. That's a strange sight, okay? Okay. This was insane. This was completely insane. He's walking out there. It's not that just something was on fire. Listen, forest fires happen all the time. It's that only that bush is on fire, and it ain't going out. It is burning, and it's burning, and it's burning. Like, Pastor Tyler, come here. This doesn't make sense to me. Like, Moses is saying this strange sight. Now, we're going to try to show him here. I feel like Maybe the Bible underplayed this just a little bit. I won't typically say this. But I'm going to be the burning bush, okay? okay. And you're going to be Moses. Okay, so get with, okay. Your, get with your sheep. Okay. Uh, real, okay. You got them? Yeah, you got to go over okay. there. Okay, and I'm the burning bush. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. It's just Moses. Yeah. It's, uh, it's Moses here with my sheep. 
this sheep, I'm going to name you uh, Tim. I'm going to name you uh, Bill. I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, ooh, you're muscular. I'm going to call you Pastor Tyler. I don't know. Just listen to that. I'm going to name you Japs. Uh, Will, Will, get away from Leslie, Will. Will, don't make me come over there. Oh. <sighs> All right, guys, let's go. Let's go up to a. Uh, what did I tell you? Will, that sheep. Well, guys, let's go up to the, the old mountain of uh, God over there. So uh, come on up. Yep. Whoa. Dang! That is one dance in fire. Okay, I feel like that's a little more what it would have been like, don't yeah, you think? probably. <laughs> Give Pastor Tyler a hand and get him out of here. The Bible says... I'm going to go over and see this strange sight, guys. This was more than a strange sight. This was more than just pe peculiar, peculiar. Like, this was insane. This bush is on fire, and it's not going out. So verse 4, as Moses is coming towards God, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. The absolute best response that you could ever give when God speaks is that, here I am. It's simple, it's to the point. It could be in a moment of worship, it could be when you're driving your car, it could be when you're reading your Bible, it could be at any time. When you create a, a place, your pasture, where God can speak and he calls to you, you're gonna feel it in your heart, you're gonna know it. It's going to be confirmed by what the Bible says. It's going to be confirmed with what leaders saying. He's going to speak. The best thing that you could ever tell him is here I am and let him just do the rest. It's that simple. You realize when you say that phrase what it means. Here I am is a phrase of surrender and obedience to God. When you say here I am, what you're saying is, Lord, use me however you see fit. Do whatever you want with me. Send me wherever you want to go. I'm yours. Here I am, you're saying Speak, Lord, I'm listening. Whatever you have to say, I'm just going to follow through. When you find yourself surrendering to the sound, you'll find yourself in his presence. I think that's the biggest thing that you need to understand. We prayed over this with the leadership team before we uh, hit the service. We pray for you guys every week, constantly. That's why we have prayer requests and things because we want to be praying for you always. We pray that. Lord, let, let us never take for granted your presence in this place. As I speak right now, the Spirit of God, his presence is moving. Some of you, are, maybe you're even here and you're kind of, you want to tune out what I have to say and, and you don't think you're going to listen. Good luck. Because when his presence is there, his voice is speaking. You ain't hear my voice, guys. This is the voice of God. This is his word. I'm just a servant. I'm just a shepherd, chilling in the pasture, trying my best to present it. We can't forget. We can't forsake. We can't give up on his presence. As Moses moved towards the bush, still unaware of what it was, it says in Exodus 3, 5, God came out and he said, do not come any closer Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Now, this scripture identifies so much of what I think about this place. Now, although I got shoes on, I don't, I don't ditch my shoes or my flip-flops or whatever. This place to me is holy ground. It's not a place that I, I treat lightly. It's not something that I take for granted. It's not something I consider a coincidence. Literally, watching y'all in worship tonight, just giving your all to Jesus. This, when we stand here, we're saying that this place is distinctly different 
than any other place. This ain't the same as where we go to the bathroom. This ain't the same as Taco Bell. This ain't the same as your classroom. This ain't the same as your bedroom. This ain't the same as your, as your college university, your workplace. This is different. When we stand here, we're saying this is holy ground. Wherever you make your pasture, that becomes his presence. Your pasture is his presence. I think that's really important to remember because whatever place that you will establish that is separate than the palace of this world, whatever place you said, this is my pasture, that is the place that becomes his presence. That is the place that God shows up, that God can be active, that God can speak. And when you allow yourself to enter a place that's burning in his presence, this is what I'll promise you. He'll speak to you. I promise. Like, I'll put the whole message, I'll put my ministry, I'll put everything on the line to tell you, if you create a place where his presence can exist, I promise you that he'll speak to you. It's my guarantee of the night. It says in verse 6, God continued after this moment, and then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now, this moment to me, this, this statement that God is making and the response, it's incredible, to me, incredible for two reasons. One, Moses never even asked who was speaking. You'll have to read it later. He walked up. It wasn't like, Moses, Moses. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, who's that? He just goes, here I am. He goes, hey, uh, yeah, I'm the, you're, that's holy ground. Uh, kick off your sandals. I'm the Lord. I'm the God of your father, Abraham. Who? Moses never asked. I think a lot of times, some of us that either don't follow God and you're here tonight and you're hearing some of these truths for the first time or somebody that know God, yet you struggle with this concept of hearing the sound of his voice, you would think this, God wants to trick me. God wants to make me work hard for it. God just makes it difficult, and he, he wants to just not let me hear his voice, and he wants me to just keep having to work to hear his voice, and uh, God, God's never going to reveal his plan to me unless I just, and you create all of these, these stigmas in your mind for what you think God's trying to do. But look at this scripture. Moses never even asked who was speaking. God was just eager to tell him that it was him. It wasn't like, uh, who, who's this? God is eager to tell you who he is. He's eager to share with you what he wants for you. He's eager for you to get to know him. He's eager to give you the sound of his voice. He's eager to do it. He's not trying to trick you. He's not trying to make it hard. He's not trying to exclude you. God is eager. If you would pay attention and if you would listen, you would see that the problem isn't whether or not God is speaking. God is always speaking. The problem is that you can't hear him in the palace. The problem is you're distant and you're disconnected because the sound of the palace is overtaking the sound of God's voice. And maybe you're going to have to wait in the pasture and be in his presence before you can actually hear the sounds. Moses walks up to him. Hey, kick off your sandals, holy ground. Okay. Oh yeah, by the way, I'm the, I'm the God of your father, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is eager to speak to you. You got to listen. You got to find your place. You got to shake off a few things that are distracting you and deceiving you. The other thing I look at is this response. There's something significant. If you look at the response of Moses to when God spoke, you'll see that there's something significant about God's voice. You'll know it even if you've never known it. There's something about when God speaks. Now, look at this. Moses was a Hebrew raised by Egyptians. He was taught the customs, the false gods, everything of the Egyptian people. It's all he knew growing up, growing up. Like, finally he realizes, well, I'm a Hebrew and I, I know the Egyptian ways and this is what I know. Let's, let's just speculate for a second. Let's just, the Bible doesn't say, let's just, let's just talk about this for a second. Could it be? Could it be maybe at one point he overheard 
one of the Hebrew people talking about their Hebrew God. I think it's maybe possible. He maybe heard of, of this God. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. Let's just, let's speculate for a second. This God, Yahweh, that they, that they serve, that they worship. Either way, the household that Moses grew up in taught him one way of life, the Egyptian way. The Egyptian customs, the Egyptian gods, the Egyptian way. That's all he knew growing up. He didn't know anything about this Abraham, Isaac, Jacob character. He wasn't taught all the stories. He wasn't taught all the ways. He was brought up like any other Egyptian. Maybe some of you tonight, you haven't been raised in a home that follows Jesus. Maybe you haven't been raised uh, with a family that prays. Maybe you haven't been raised where you know stories like Moses and, I don't know, Noah and John the Baptist and who Jesus is. And maybe, maybe it's kind of like distant things you've heard, but it's not like you have been trained up and you know what the Bible says. Maybe that's just not how you've been raised. And I feel like some of you tonight, you're scared that you're going to miss God's voice. You're, you're fearful that he's going to speak and you're going to miss it because you don't have enough knowledge and you haven't been trained up enough and like you don't have the Bible memorized and a ton of scriptures and like you're not all prepared to hear his voice. Look at this in verse six again. Then he said, this is God. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. This could have been any God. There are thousands and thousands of gods. False idols, fake gods, crap gods, let's just call it what it is, that other religions worship, live for. At this time, the Egyptians, they had gods. This could have been any god. He didn't know this Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why did Moses hide his face? If this was just, well, whatever, why was it so specific immediately? It doesn't just say a god. It says, capital G, at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Why? Because even if, maybe you haven't grown up in this, maybe even if you're brand new in this, maybe if you're taking all this in for the first time or you're just still learning as we all are about the things of God, even if you're not familiar with God's voice, even if you've never seen him, creation is always drawn to its creator, always. It's a magnet, there's a natural pull. We are drawn in to the one who made us. His voice, his face, so Moses immediately, although he didn't know all about this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he didn't grow up knowing about this Yahweh. He maybe overheard, let's just speculate some things at best, but he had never had an encounter for the first time. He's a Hebrew. He should have known all about God, yet he knew nothing. He should have been like all the other Hebrews that grew up knowing all the customs, the traditions, the stories, all about the law of God and who Abraham was. He, he didn't know anything. And so for the first time, he's 40 years old, and he's coming into an encounter with God. And he hides his face because in, 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 the, in the midst of this moment, the majesty of God, it overwhelmed him and overtook him. And he's there, and he's looking into this fire, and he can see God. He can hear God. We are made in the image of God. In the very beginning, you look at Genesis, we are made in this image. It's like when God speaks, I know that's audible, but it's as if we're looking in a mirror. That's what it's like. We can recognize God's voice is just the same as you can look in a mirror and recognize your face. Why? Because you're the image of him. So when you look in a mirror, you're looking at the face, the image of God. So we can hear his voice. We can know him through the flames, we can hear him speaking. You'll recognize him because we were made in his image. And God's calling out to you tonight. I really have felt over and over that some of you, he's calling you to this a mission. He's calling you to something specific as we're ending school years and college students are ending and we're going into the summer, that he's really calling you 
to something beyond just coming to church on Wednesdays and Sundays, something just beyond being with progression on Tuesdays, something a little, a little farther beyond that. He's calling you through the flames to something more specific, and he wants you to hear so you can share. He isn't like, hey, keep coming so you can keep hearing. And he's like, no, what you hear, you need to share. You need to show people. They are going to hear the sound of my voice through you and your actions. And I feel like God's just been telling me that, but maybe some of you feel like Moses did. Look at Moses' response. God's calling him to this big thing. And in verse 10, this is how Moses is responding. God's like, so now go. I'm, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh to give my people Get them out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Like, who am I, God? And some of you, your insecurity is keeping you from hearing God's voice. Your fears are keeping you from hearing God's voice. Your doubt. You struggle with your self-image and you can't value yourself so you couldn't think God could have anything spectacular for you because you're just average and you really couldn't do anything that great. Moses was a stutterer. La, 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 la. He had a stuttering problem. He can't talk. When God was calling him, he was like, he couldn't talk. So when he went before the Pharaoh and before the, the people of Egypt, his brother Aaron had to come with him and talk to be his mouthpiece. He was kind of like, say this to him, Aaron. And Aaron had to like just boldly go out because he was good with words. Moses was the most insecure person you could think of. And that's who God called, not from the palace, from the pasture. He brought him from being just a Hebrew that wanted to be slaughtered by Pharaoh. He raised him up to be the prince of Egypt and then dropped him again and then gave him his call. And some of you are like, man, I, 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 I couldn't do that. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could. I feel like some of you are like, man, I, I don't know enough of the Bible. <laughs> there's, no, there's no way. There's no way I can share the sound. I don't know enough about the Bible. Like, I've only been coming to church like a month, man. I've heard like three sermons because I've missed a week, like tops. Like, God can't use me. Yeah, he can. If God can use a, a Hebrew Egyptian stutterer to go rescue the Hebrews from the Egyptians, it's like a weird family crazy thing going on here. I think he can use you. I think he can use you. And God's not wanting the sound to be shut up in this place. He's saying, I need a few people. Listen, if one of you, if just one of you would hear this message tonight and respond wholeheartedly to say, no, I'm going to be used by God. That's going to be me. Yeah, I got a certain problem. You know, God became angry. Finally, Moses was like, I, I, can't, I, 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 I can't do this, God. And, and God was, it said, the Bible says he burned with anger. Because I need my, he's like, I need my brother. Because God's plan was never to need Aaron. God called Moses. Moses started chickening out, needing Aaron. Listen, God's calling you. You want to team up with, and bring your Aaron with you? You guys go team up again. But God's calling you all to be Moses tonight. Despite your insecurities, despite your weaknesses, despite your fears, God's calling you and saying, I want to use you to be my mouthpiece. It's crazy that he picks a stutterer to be his mouthpiece. He literally said, I'm going to give you, I'm going to put my words in your mouth of a stutterer. And that is exactly who God chose. Moses is like, who am I? How can I go before the king of Israel? Who am I? All that you have to do is respond to the sound and be willing to be used of God. He'll do the rest. In verse 13, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and, and, and say to them, he's kind of like really unsure, like, um, the God of your fathers has sent me. And they ask me, what, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Moses is like, dude, for real, how do I do this? I don't really know anything about you. Like, I kind of like, I'm feeling like I know you. I'm getting this kind of cool connection with you through the flames right now. This is sweet, God, but I haven't been raising this. I don't know anything about this. Like, what if I go and make a fool of myself? And they're like, so who sent you? What's his name? Like, God, what's your name? Can you tell me? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. When your response is, who am I? 
God's response is, I am. When you're like, who, who, who am I? Like, what, what can I do for God? Who am I? God responds, I am. When you feel inadequate, when you feel incapable, when you feel like, man, I, I'm trying to hear God, I don't know if I can, when you're just like a straight noob, and you're like, man, I'm just like a noob, I, I know nothing about this Jesus thing, is brand frank, spanking fresh new, like I've been doing this even a year, and I feel like I'm so still far off. When you're feeling inadequate and incapable, and you're like, who am I? That's when God comes in, remember, he's the I am who's speaking. He's the one that's gonna put words in your mouth. He's the I am who has a plan for your life. In the book of John, now, Jesus is with all these Jews and they're questioning him. And they're asking him, who are you? You want to know Jesus' response? John 8, 58. Truly, truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. If you look at this account, you got to read it again. We're going to sit on this. We're going to step in this. We're going to get in the pasture and we're just going to get Dig down in it, we're going to wait. When Moses hears the sound, he sees the flames. You know what the Bible says? It says in Exodus 3, 2, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of the fire within a bush. So here's Jesus in the New Testament, in the book of John, 1,500 years later, from this moment at a burning bush, and they're using the same terminology, must be complete coincidence. You know who was in the flames? Jesus. The angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, they're referencing Jesus, the great I am. So when Jesus is in the flames, and he's saying, I am who I am. And he's standing before all the Jews and they're saying, what's your name? He's saying, before Abraham, when he was just a little baby coming out of the womb, I am. He's the first, the last, the beginning and the end. He is who was and is and is to come. He is, I am. So when you are throwing up your, who am I? He's saying, I am. What I have to give you tonight this message this word of God it's not to just inspire you it's to challenge you you got to find your place in the pasture to hear him first of all you can never fulfill what God has for you if you don't find your place you got to change some things we got to change some things We can't be caught up in the next hype thing. That will not last. That will not sustain us. That will become old and boring. We're leading in the summertime. Everybody's like, yeah, summertime. It's so hyped. It's so lit. You want to know what's lit? What's lit is when you sit in the pasture and you look for the bush on fire. That's what's lit. Not waiting for the next exciting thing. Not waiting for the next moment to get you all high and make you all feel good. That stuff will fade. You know what won't fade? When you create some habits where you daily sit in the presence of God. I got like pulling the trigger on me right now. Where you daily sit and you remove the palace and you sit in the pasture and you say, okay, God, speak to me. Here I am. Because there is a sound that he's offering you the sound that he's speaking to you, that you don't have to be adequate to have. You don't have to be qualified to have. You don't have to be talented to have. You could have your stuttering issues, your problems, your insecurities. And when the words of I am are put inside your mouth and your heart, do you realize why, do you realize why he's given this to us? Because there's a city There are families, there are schools, there are friends, there are people that are in slavery. And you know what God would have us say when we approach their circumstances? When the devil has got them so bound, so pitiful, like we once were in our sin. You know what he wants us to say? Let 
my people go. When Moses stood before Pharaoh, that's what him and Aaron said. They didn't say, hey, uh, uh, Pharaoh, uh, could you, uh, could they possibly, probably, maybe go? Let my people go. Somebody say it with me. Let my people go. One more time. Let my people go go. God wants to plant a sound in you, a confidence in you that you have to fight for, that you have to work for, that you have to position yourself to gain. Because in the palace, you ain't going to see no bushes on fire in a palace. You got to get in the wilderness. You got to get in the pasture. You got to get where nobody else is. Jesus goes, when you go to pray to me, he said, I want you to go where no one else is going to see you. A place that's private with God. I ain't looking for you to stand up and make public declarations of who I am and make yourself look good. I want you to go where no one else knows that you're there and you're saying, I'm in the pasture. I ain't looking for the credentials of a palace. I ain't looking to be prince. I ain't looking to be king. I ain't looking to be queen or princess. I am here with the sheep and it's dirty and I don't like this. I don't like my family. I don't like my job. I don't like this place. But I know if I'm here and if I know I'm now, you're going to position me to see the flames, to see the fire, to see what you are doing actively and what you're going to speak so I can stand before anything, before anyone. Let my people go. Would somebody give God a shout of praise? Come on. We get to get excited for what God wants to use us for. But this message, without you activating into it, is all hype. And I can yell and I can rile us up and I can get us excited. But if it's not going to drive us to our knees before God, then it doesn't mean anything. It just doesn't. This is God's word, and it says it's not going to go out and return void to me. It's going to be active. It's going to do something. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It's going to pierce through anything you got going on. It wants to just bring you alive. But you're not going to hear the sound when the band's on stage and hypes moments. Yeah, God will speak to you through that. You're not even going to hear it just when I preach. Yeah, God can speak to you through it. You're going to hear it when you are alone and you're desperate and you're in the pasture with stinky situations that no one else knows about, but you're there and you're doing what you know you've been placed and, and put to do, and God's going to use you right there, and that's when he's going to raise you up to proclaim who he is. So every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're saying tonight, I just, I just want God to speak to me. I want to see him active. I want to see him burning. I want to be used. Then the first step is to, as his creation, come towards him as the creator. The first step is to recognize that when you see him, you see yourself because you were made in his image. The first step is to acknowledge that this Jesus of the New Testament that spoke it before these people in John chapter 8, I am, is the same Jesus in the flames back with Moses that had a plan saying, hey, when you don't feel like you can do it and you're questioning who you are, hey, it's okay. I know who I am and I'm going to get you through. So if you do not have this Jesus... If he's not the Lord and Savior of your life, if you have not claimed him on the cross, this ain't religion, this ain't tradition, this ain't culture, this ain't any certain thing that drives us there. It is the love of God that he so loved us that he sent Jesus to die. And we could know all the, the stories in the Bible. We could know all there is to know. But if we do not come into an encounter like Moses did at the burning bush, if we don't come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, and what's the point? So if you're here tonight, you're saying, I don't need religion. I need a relationship with a loving Savior. Then put your hand up and claim Jesus with me right now. Thank you. Thank you. Bold hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. 
Hands up all over. You can put it up and put it down. Anybody else, you're just saying, man, I need Jesus tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I need I am. Do this with me. Stand on your feet as we end. I was asking the Lord, do I bring us to the altar to wait and to hear God? And I felt like God was saying, no, I want you to give it to him straight. I want you to send him out. You know why I brought Mason up to do uh, connect with me? Seventh grader, scared out of his mind. I was texting him last night. I don't know if he was trying to match me on purpose. He's like, dude, we got the same hat on. Um, we were teaming up. Uh, he's texting me last night. He's like, dude, I am so scared. I am so nervous. You know why I brought him up? Because at a young age, he feels called to the ministry. I was never given this opportunity, ever at that age. I didn't start stepping into things like, like even remotely close to what I'm doing now until I was 16, and still it was nothing like what we have set up now. The opportunities for you to serve, to grow in your giftings. We got so many amazing leaders and amazing people from, from music to all kinds of different tech and just oh, crazy. I knew if I could get him up here right now and he could start conquering that and learning his anointing right now. He was like, I'm so scared to face all of them. I didn't, I didn't tell him, imagine them naked. I didn't tell him anything. I just said, you can do it. And then at the end, I go, hey, it's all you, bro. And I walked off stage and I left him because I knew if he could right now begin to understand what God can use him for, then by the time he's my age, He's going to be way past me. Right now, right here, this is the time for you to develop the habits that will track the rest of your life. Don't wait till you're my age. It's way too hard to create new habits. It's way too hard. Don't wait till your parents' age. It won't happen. People become stuck. Right here, is where you can learn when you walk out of this room how to create a place of pasture in his presence to hear the sound. If you quiet and wait, he'll show up. If he shows up, anything's possible after that. If tonight you want to pray a prayer with me, and we're going to do it together, but of confidence to receive the sound of Jesus' forgiveness as well as, I'm going to pray over you as you leave, that you can start developing some habits. You all need to be texting each other. You need to be saying, hey, you, you finding your pasture? Text each other. Put on your Facebook. Anybody else finding their pasture? Hey, I just want to encourage you all. Find your place. Ditch the palace. Rest in the pasture. Find his presence. Hear the sound. Like, you all need to be posting. You all need to be texting. You all need me. Why? We need to spur each other on because if you can learn right now, the devil wants nothing more than for you to just be lazy, love your Netflix, love your friendships, love everything else, then you love his presence because if you can do that, then you're going to get to my age and be like, oh crap, man, I wish I would have started that sooner. And then you're going to try to start developing all these habits that are just really hard to start. But right now, at your age is when people become addicted to everything, guys. People become addicted to pornography. They become addicted to, to, to heroin, to alcohol, to whatever. Like right here is where addictions are formed that last a lifetime. Why not become addicted to Jesus? Why not become addicted to his presence? Why not right here at a young age become addicted to just sit in even 15 minutes Start for 15 minutes, 15, just unrestrained, just you're sitting there and you're like, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to bind myself to everything else. I'm just going to sit here and God, why not start that right now? So if you want to do that with me, if you want to receive Jesus, if you want to allow God to plant in you the confidence to, to live this thing out, then pray this with me. Say, Jesus, help me to live this thing out. Help me to ditch the palace and rest in your presence. Help me to be okay with the wilderness, the places that I thought weren't that great. Show me that in those places, 
That's where you're going to speak. That's where you're going to teach me. That's where you're going to build me up to be sent out, to be a leader, to be an instrument used for your gospel and for your name. Use me, Jesus, how you will. Here am I. I'm yours. Speak. I'm listening. God, tonight, I just pray over each one. That prayed that prayer that says, tonight, Jesus, I give you my whole heart. I give you my ways. I give you my past. I give you my future. I give you everything. Lord, I pray over each one here that's saying, I want to receive the sound. I pray that you teach them new habits. I pray at this age, when it's not popular to do this, when it's not a cool thing to just rest and be with Jesus, when their time seems a lot better spent at sports events or watching TV or, I don't know, riding their bike or playing video games or, or, or doing anything else, anything, but spending time with Jesus. Devil, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, and I say, get your hands off them, because right now is when their habits are going to be formed. Right now is when they're going to learn how to trust in the Lord with all their heart and lean not on their own understanding, but in all their ways, every single thing they do, they're going to acknowledge you, and you're going to make every place straight, every path right. I know that right now, God, you're speaking to hearts. You're speaking to every life in this place. And I know that if you're speaking that if just one person tonight would receive, I know you could change. You could change this place as we know it. You could change our cities. You could change our state. You could change our country and world for all that matter if just one person would say, here I am. Let my people go. Somebody say it with me. Say, let my people go. One more time. All you got. Let my people go. I lie. One more time. Let my people go. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.